Well, amen, amen. Good to be saved. Amen. Good to be in church. Yes. Good to burn my eyes out with that light. That's what I did. Amen. Well, um, hey, before I begin, in all seriousness, uh, you might write this down. I want to give you a prayer request. I got a call just before uh, the service. <clears throat> this fellow by the name of James Dalton, D A L T O N. Uh, I've known James for about 25 years. He's out of the church there in Boise. Um, about four or five years ago, uh, he took a church about 45 miles south of Boise. He has been pastoring that church. And about three or four years ago, his kidneys uh, started to fail him. And he needed a kidney transplant. And one of the students in one of my classes uh, donated a kidney. That's grace, brother. Yes. That's, gra- that's grace I don't have, I'll be honest with you. But uh, he, he, this past Tuesday, they did, they did the surgery. And it was the guy who donated the kidney that called me tonight. He is doing well. Uh, but they cannot get the kidney to start functioning uh, in Brother Dalton. And I said, well, what are they doing? He said, well, they're, they're going to put him on dialysis again, try to jumpstart the kidney. <clears throat> and they said, if it does not start, they're going to consider it a failed attempt um, and take it out. But here's what a failed attempt is. He goes on the bottom of the kidney donor list. And also... Uh, uh, he said, well, uh, you know, because I mean, he's the, the guy, you know, you, he didn't have another three years without the kidney. Um, and he said, uh, well, his wife asked him something about it. And they, the doctor said, well, we have no long-term plans for your husband. So um, if you would remember James Dalton, he is a good man, has been a stalwart uh, for the Lord, uh, his family. And so uh, if you'd remember him in prayer. I told, uh, I told the, the brother that called tonight, I would, I would uh, tell you folks, because that just get as many people uh, as we can praying for him. Um, let, me, let me give you a testimony about what uh, you mentioned, Umberto Gomez. I met Umberto a few years ago. Uh, I met Umberto, well, probably 25 years ago, maybe, and um, before he did his Bible translation. And I have people ask me, thank you, brother. I ask people to ask me, you know, what's the best Spanish translation of the Bible? I love easy questions. That's an easy one. I said, oh, no. I don't know Spanish. I'm not qualified to make that. I don't, I don't make statements uh, on, on um, Bible translations in foreign languages, not authoritative statements. <clears throat> but um, I said, look, if, if, if you give me a Spanish Bible and Acts 8.37 is missing, I can tell it's bad. But if Acts 8.37 is in there, that doesn't necessarily make it good. But I talked to a missionary that uh, spent 12 years in Mexico, and I said, what did you use? He said, I used the Relaine of Valera. And uh, he said, there's about 30 to 35 places where it was doctrinally really bad. And he said, I would correct those. Uh, he, he actually corrected them from the King James Bible. And he said, then, uh, then Alberto Go- uh, Umberto Gomez uh, came out with this translation, and he said, I grabbed his first edition, and he said, instead of 20 or 35 places, he said, about... Uh, Maybe, maybe 21 I had to correct. Umberto had, had those right. And he said, then he came out with his second edition, and he said, now I'm, I'm correcting only about uh, 14 or 15. He said, he came out with his third edition. He said, now I'm correcting about eight places. I'm using the Gomez and only have to correct about eight places. He said, when he came out with his fourth edition, which I believe is his final edition, <clears throat> he said, every single um, error from, uh, from a related of uh, Relena Valera had been corrected. He said, I could preach from it without ever uh, making any corrections to it. So I tell people, I said, I highly suspect that that Gomez is probably the best uh, Spanish translation. So, uh, and you think about this. You think about putting the word of God in that pure form into the Spanish-speaking people. He has done something that very few people living have done. Uh, this is called <clears throat> Money is a Defense. Uh, so is Kevlar. But... Um, uh, that book, you know, that is a little book, but I'm going to tell you guys, I don't know who was it first said uh, why they call it common sense when it's so uncommon, but that has got some of the best common sense uh, financial advice that you will find. Um, you will find out you can live within your income. Uh, you may not want to get it because you might find out that you have to quit doing some stuff, but um, uh, anyway, that, uh, that book is back there, Rightly Dividing <clears throat> God's Word Through Dispensations. That's the long title. Uh, I call this Dispensations 101. 
Uh, and every now and then I, I run into somebody and go, I don't believe in dispensations. And I go, well, you believe in the Old New Testament? Yes. Okay. And let me tell you, you know, to be very honest, the reason most people will take a step back from dispensational teaching of the Bible is because they're afraid they're not going to, they're intimidated. They're, they think they're not going to get it. Uh, if you don't think there's a, there's a dispensational change in the Bible, let me ask you a question. What, what do I have to do to, get, to be saved? Yeah. What do I have to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, okay, what do I have to do to get eternal life? Same thing. Same thing, okay? Acts 16, the Philippian jailer said to Paul, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Um, Matthew chapter 19, the, man, the, the, the one man said to the Lord Jesus Christ, what do I have to do to gain eternal life? And he said, keep the commandments. You would want to take Jesus' soul winning in Matthew 19. Okay? You say, well, how can that be? Read your Bible. Study your Bible. That will help you. That book will help you. Uh, this one is Mormon Doctrines in Light of the Bible. Uh, we passed a uh, Mormon church when we were driving around today. And so uh, that, that, this is one of those that I call it's not a Bible, or it's not a book. These two are books. This is not a book. This is a bullet. And you know what you do with a bullet? You load your gun and you do one of two things. You defend yourself or you go hunting. Amen. That's right. And there's a few books back there that allow you to do that. Uh, the answer book allow you to do that. Uh, this one. You guys really, you should know. In fact, you know what I tell Christians what they ought to do? So if you're a Christian, listen. Um, I believe this. I think you guys ought to know, you ought to study how to, how to, um, to respond to Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses. Then you ought to go door to door in your neighborhood and say, hey, you ever have Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses knocking on your door? Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, would you rather they didn't? Yeah, I wish they would. I live right over at that house. Next time a Mormon knocks on your door, send them over to me. <laughs> I think you should be your neighborhood defender. I'm telling you, you say, well, what good's it going to do? It's not going to help the Mormon. It, it will help that guy. And he will, he will thank you. So, uh, you know, be your, be your neighborhood defender. Uh, I call it, you know, messing up a Jehovah Witness fire mission. Just, I, I try to make backslidden Jehovah Witnesses. Um, this one, you guys know the, uh, the Big Deal KJV uh, videos that we have. This is, this is all seven uh, of the KJV, the, the production videos that uh, we have on the Internet. Uh, this also has the eighth video, which is a response to James White, uh, who thought he had a response to every uh, video. And then there's a bonus. There's one in here on um, the mid-tribulation rapture uh, that I did. So there's nine, uh, there's nine uh, uh, production videos. They're all well done. So uh, that is there. And then speaking of Stephen Anderson, and I um, uh, just had a pastor call me today. Uh, he's going to come and visit me next, uh, uh, two days from now, for, uh, Friday, Friday, um, about some young men. Uh, I'm telling you, the, the, he's gone beyond infiltrating the churches uh, by people watching on the Internet. Now he's having people join. I'm not, I'm not saying he is specifically ordering it, but his people are joining churches like this one and then proselyting uh, the believers into believing in the mid-tribulation rapture and hating Israel. And let's all move to Phoenix where, you know, that's the new Jerusalem. And so um, uh, this one, this is the uh, uh, what is it, pre I never say it right. Post-trib, pre-wrath, <clears throat> whatever it is. Uh, look, guys, you can go through as much tribulation as you want. I'm not going through any of it. I have a mother-in-law. That is as close to tribulation as I ever want to get. Oh, that it should only have been seven years. But um, anyway, uh, this is uh, two DVDs. These are two CDs. Two CDs. This is audio. <clears throat> but again, that will help you because um, I, I, was, I was telling a pastor... Uh, I was teaching at a, at a uh, Bible conference, and I taught one night on um, the, that we're not going halfway through the tribulation. And I could tell, uh, first off, the, the pastor that invited me there was kind of looking at me like, I, why did you, uh, you know, why did you do that? And I had a very good friend, pastor, who I will be preaching for in a few weeks. A very good friend came up and said, uh, well, that was a good message if, if anybody needed it. And then he went home and called me two days later and said, I got back home and found out Three families in my church have been watching this guy on the internet, and I got a mess on my hands. Thanks for the message. And then the pastor who uh, had invited me, he has Bible college, uh, and he called me and, uh, up, and he was livid. He said, three of my graduates have gotten messed up with that guy. So, um, and uh, pray, we have some more plans. I'll just tell you, we have some more plans uh, to, um, uh, to, to keep uh, doctrine straight. 
Um, I want to talk to you about something. I'll tell you what this is based on. Uh, go to Isaiah 14, but I want you to go to 2 Timothy. <clears throat> now, you know, if you talk to the contemporaries, they say this. Well, we're, we're being realistic with the generation that we're in. You know, this is a rock and roll generation, so you've got to be a rock and roll church. And this is a generation that doesn't dress up for anything, so you don't dress up for anything. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is a generation that takes dope and drugs and bed hops, so they do it all in the name of Jesus, I guess. But um, um, I don't buy that, okay? I don't think that you join the uh, Red Chinese Army to defeat it. Um, but I will tell you that, that I am... Uh, in, in about the last year and a half, I am making, I don't know what to say, <clears throat> I am, uh, it, is, it is altering my preaching for our generation. Uh, and here is what I mean. Look at, uh, look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. And in this, um, in this passage, the Apostle Paul prophesied something. And what he prophesied, <clears throat> now he's prophesied the rapture and many other things, <clears throat> that have not come to pass in our lives yet, right? But he prophesies something that has come to pass in our life. He says this, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who should judge the quick and the dead. Now, I've always said you've got to be from Texas to understand about the quick and the dead. Um, judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Now look at verse 3. For the time will come. All right, wait a second. If Paul says the time will come, then what he's about to tell us is not going on in his day. So, so when he says the time will come, is he prophesying? All right, look what he says. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust <clears throat> shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away uh, their ears from the truth, now, and should be turned unto fables. Uh, one, of those, uh, one of the examples of that is this mid-tribulation rapture thing. Uh, Reformed theology, uh, Messianic uh, Christians who born, you know, from, they're, like they're Irish and suddenly they get saved and start dancing around and keeping the Passover. Uh, they are not, and there is a spirit. Listen, guys, there is a spirit in our world today that was not there at the time of the Apostle Paul in which you and I, it says they, that's us guys, look, you're not inoculated. You're not, you're not immune to this, okay? Uh, that is why, uh, I say it this way, if, if, if we decided tonight to pick some just really crazy doctrine, my dream has always been, the Bible talks about the latter growth, and my dream has always been to start the church of the latter growth. And all the men will have mullet haircuts. And that'll be the church of the latter growth. And see, you guys all laugh. Uh, and if I tried to do that 100 years ago, so would the rest of the world. But if I tried to do it today, I'm telling you, because, look, think about this. What's the other half of that equation? If you will not endure sound doctrine, then what will you endure? Unsound doctrine. Paul says, you have need that I teach you what? Again. And this may be, again, this may be, again, for the benefit of our young people, because you know, our young people are brought up in our church, uh, in our churches, and, and we just kind of figure they got the doctrines down, and, it, and they, that is that generation that is getting really wooed away from good doctrine. And so I'm going to talk to you tonight about hell. Uh, there is a hell, and if there has ever been a doctrine that, that is foundational and is under attack, <clears throat> it is the doctrine that there is a literal fire in the heart of this earth, that is hell, where people who don't trust Jesus Christ go when they die. Guys, that's all there is to it. That is the truth. But you get this, you know, you know, uh, uh, I say this about a place I go, because it's true. Uh, America, uh, up until this past Friday, uh, America for about uh, 20 or 30 years now has been run by overbearing women and effeminate men. That's right. Yes, sir. Now, ladies, if that, if that bothers you, don't come up and tell me. Because I'll know. Just tell, look at your husband and go, go tell him, worm. But um, it is, you know, that's the problem. I always say this. Democrats are, are crooks, but Republicans are cowards. Yeah. Yes, sir. And Republicans, everything they do, they're, they're afraid. And, and, and 
you, shout, you find a politician, you know what a politician is? That's a man who is trying to say something so he doesn't offend a woman. And so we're in this age. And you know, what, you know what's big with women? Compassion. Now, I like that. Come on, guys. We need that. That's why they make good nurses. I mean, you, know, you need somebody. What's a, what's a dad say? Boy, get up, put that arm back on. You'll be okay. <laughs> and then mom comes, at least tries to tape it. And so, so you need compassion. But do you ever notice how much stuff is all about you men? You just don't have any compassion. Instead of going, oh, I'm sorry, say, you're right. Well, what do you want me to do? Be like you? That's what God made women for. You cry. In fact, cry twice because I'm not going to cry at all. And so this, 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 well, I just don't want to offend anybody. And, and I don't want to make anybody upset. And I don't want to make anybody mad. Well, I got news for you. You tell somebody, hey, guess what? Don't trust Christ. You're going to die and you're going to burn for eternity. That's an upsetting statement. That's right. And that is part of why, why doctrine, doctrine is so important. That is why doctrine is being, is being, is falling by the wayside. So what I'm going to give you uh, is just a great deal of scripture uh, on a, on a doctrine that you already know. Uh, and I don't know who this will help. I, I'm, not even, I'm not even talking tonight about hell because I fear that somebody here is not saved. If you are not saved, you better listen. If you think you are saved, there have been, you know, uh, you know, I got baptized when I was young and I've been a member of this church all my life. Whatever, whatever pipe dream that you are trusting, you know, my dad and mom were, were brought, brought me up in this church. Whatever it is, guys, you need to trust the death the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as the sole and complete payment for your sin, or you will burn for eternity. Uh, you know, uh, Billy Graham, uh, I think, I think, I'm not sure, I think that early in his ministry, he, pre- he preached that hell was fire, that you die and you go there. If you die without Christ, you go there and spend eternity. Um, I heard him preach probably about 20, 25 years ago, uh, and he said, uh, you will die and be separated from God. Well, that's a change. He said, well, you're just trying to scare people. I had a guy was preaching on the street one time. This guy goes, you preach on hell. You're just trying try, try to scare people into, into getting saved. I said, he, I said, buddy, I'd take him in a wheelbarrow if I could. If the thought of dying. Now, let's say this. You, I would tell you you'd be separated from God. But, but David said, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. So you won't be eternally separated from God, but you will be eternally punished. Well, I just don't think he's God of compassion. You just don't think. That is the problem. And so I'm asking, the, the, is, is there a hell? Is it this fire that we talk about? Is it eternal? Uh, are we going to get, you know, you know that reincarnation is on the uh, upswing, the belief in reincarnation in this country? And, and are people, because well, you, well, you know why that is? Computer games. Come on, who plays a computer game and you get killed and go, oh, this guy three more lives. Oh, oh, I just got another life. Hey, there's no reincarnation. You, you, could, you could come back as a dog. Worse, you could come back as a Democrat. And so, um, you know, the really low life forms. But um, uh, go to Isaiah 14. Why is there a hell? Uh, Let's look at, um, well, let's just pray and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you now, God, for you. We thank you, God, for this book. Uh, We thank you, God, for doctrine. You said there are three things that that we need in ours, in us, inside of us. We need, you said to give uh, give attendance to exhortation, to doctrine, to reading. God, reading is reading your Bible. Exhortation is the preaching of your Bible, but doctrine is the foundation. And so many churches, they, they have wandered from doctrine. They have a statement that, that states their doctrine. They, and that's kind of like, like, like that gives them a buy. They don't have to preach it or teach it anymore. Uh, as long as that, that's their disclaimer. Yeah, we believe all that stuff. We just don't talk about it anymore. And then there's a young generation in this country who mean well. And they are just wandering. God, I look at public schools and our, our, our children from public schools don't know the presidents, don't know the states. Don't know the history of this country. But then I look at our churches and the same thing is true of our doctrine. Because there's been a failing on some side. And I don't believe believe Pastor Frederick has been failing on teaching doctrine. I don't mean that, God. I really don't. I don't. I don't mean that. I just mean that we are in the time when that spirit would draw us away from good doctrine, sound doctrine. And so maybe tonight someone... Uh, just a little bit, just a little bit, maybe that. 
Get a little wishy-washy on where people go when they're lost. Don't like to think about somebody being in hell for eternity. God, I pray that maybe uh, uh, your Bible and the authority of your Bible will establish this for me. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Isaiah chapter 14. <clears throat> this is uh, one of two great Old Testament chapters that we will be looking at both of them uh, on, uh, on the devil. And it says this in verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? All right, first thing we find out is that Lucifer at one time was in heaven, was he not? Okay. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, <clears throat> which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, now I probably have, have pointed this out before, but it, it always merits repeating because it's truth. You know one of the worst things you can say is, I will. Oh, you know this, you're the captain of your soul, you know. No, you're not. No, you know, I will do this. Well, there's a lot of things you think you'll do. You may not. You listen, you can't get out of this building if God didn't want you to. <clears throat> and, the, and the devil says, I will. And he makes a mistake of saying it five times. And watch what he says. Verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. But it says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Keep in mind then that the pit is another name for hell. There are times in the Old Testament or even the New where, where the pit, it may not always refer to hell. But when you see pit, say, hey, this may be a passage on hell. There may be uh, more to this passage than what I'm reading. But the Bible says that it's going to be, uh, you're going to, he's going to go down to hell. Uh, so, so the devil was planning to take over heaven. Now, guys, um, how are you going to get God off the throne? He's going to take, he's going to, he's going to take, take over heaven, right? Do you ever stop and think about this? You know what the devil's plan was? He was going to murder God. I mean, what's he going to do? He's got to think he could do it because God isn't going to take this laying down. So he is going to, in some way, get rid of God uh, and overthrow God. Now, so this all starts with the rebellion in heaven. Now, remember this, I will five times. Look at verse 14 and look at the last. We're just going to pay attention to the last I will. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So the last I will the devil said was, when, this, when I'm all done, I will be like God. And of course, think of how many people are like that. You know, um, you guys watched uh, Little House in the Prairie and Bonanza and I, uh, I don't know what else uh, Michael Landon played in. And you liked him and I liked him. You know, I, the guy always seemed like moral and his, his, his programs are always moral. And, I, and, and he got cancer and he died. And I heard him giving an interview. Uh, and, and I'm telling you something, guys. You know, if you want the defi definition of lost, listen to somebody lost try to talk spiritual. And I'm listening to a guy who... As far as, I couldn't complain about just about anything he made as far as entertainment. It wasn't uh, sexy. It wasn't vile. It was always some, some kind of a good moral story or something. And the guy is totally lost. I mean, in the woods, at night, with no moon, no stars. Uh, and, he, and his bottom line on this whole thing, is he says, well, basically, I think that I am God. Well, that's, but isn't that it? And man wants to be God. So, so the, the bottom line, the last I will of the devil was, I will be like the Most High. All right, now go to a, a Ezekiel chapter 28 and the second great chapter in the Old Testament about Lucifer. And verse 12. <clears throat> So the man take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. And they say, well, this is about the king of Tyrus. This isn't about uh, the devil. Well, let's find out where the king of Tyrus has been. And, and saying to him, thus saith the Lord, thou sealest up the sum of full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Okay, guys. Look, I, I like beauty. I mean, don't you like things that are beautiful? You really do. But beware of it. You know, years ago, before I ever got saved, uh, I'd been dating this girl, and then she got all twinkle dusted with Mormonism. And I remember she tried to convert me to Mormonism, and I didn't, I didn't get into it, but everything was beautiful. The, if you look at Mormon um, publications, uh, you can't get better 
uh, artwork. You can't get better photography. Uh, everything is done beautiful. And the devil knows things have to be beautiful. You know, it's our churches that meet in the storefront with a 50-watt light bulb. But look at, the, look at all of the, the, the heathen. <clears throat> so, look what it says. This king of Tyrus, verse 13, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, I don't think the king of Tyrus at that time had been there, but this one had, and this is the devil. Uh, every, precious, uh, st- every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Now keep this in mind. The devil is not eternal. He is a created being. He has had a beginning. God has had no beginning. Jesus is God. He has had no beginning. All right? Uh, you know, I think the Mormon church teaches Jesus and the devil were brothers. Uh, only, the only thing wrong with that teaching is it's wrong. And he had a job. Look what it says. Thou art in a, the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou hast set upon uh, thou wast set upon the, the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. All right, he had a job. You know what the devil's job was? He was the anointed cherub that covereth. His, his physical position, here is the throne of God, and his physical position was above the throne to manifest the glory of God. Now, um, I, uh, you know, I came out of the Catholic Church, and I, I like, I don't mind stained glass. I don't like... Um, mosaic stained glass. Um, when I talk about, you know, you like Jesus praying in a garden or Mary with her heartburn uh, or, or anything like that. I don't mean picture stained glass. But let me ask you a question. Do you ever wonder where stained glass, the, the concept of stained glass and churches? Where did churches get this idea of stained glass? Oh, man. I'll tell you where they got it. From God. The whole thing is, the whole thing is of God. Think about this. Have you ever been to one of those places, you know, where they had that, like that disco ball where the, it's rotating and the light's bouncing off. You ever, you ever seen one of those? Where have you guys been? <laughs> anyway, look, look, at verse, look at verse 13. Here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think, if you've ever seen one light, you take that disco ball in here with one light, and it just goes all over the place. Imagine the glory of God bouncing off. It says that the, the, that the devil... His covering was with a sardis and topaz and diamond and beryl and onyx and jasper and sapphire and emerald. He was, he was studded with multiple colored precious gems. It would be like one of those disco balls in technicolor. Now, can you imagine as the glory of God reflected off of him and, and it was manifest to all of heaven? That was his job. Now, the problem is, I would say it went to his head. But it didn't. It went to his heart. That's right. yes. And that's what you have to be careful, guys. You have to be careful uh, when something goes to your heart. And so his, his job was to manifest the glory of God. But I'll tell you what he's like. He's kind of like the moon. Does the moon give light? No. Man, it's a dead planet. Isn't that true? It's not a planet. But it's a dead object in space, right? What is the glory of the moon? The sun. The sun reflects off the moon, but isn't that funny because we never sing about the sun? I mean, whoever says this, you know, shine on, shine on, harvest sun. Whoever says, oh, I was walking with my wife, just holding hands, walking in the light of the full sun. We always give the moon the credit. If the moon had an ego and heard our songs, it might go to its heart. And so all of this glory, the light of God was manifest <clears throat> off of this, this uh, anointed cherub. Look what it says, verse 15. Thou, ha- thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was, uh, uh, that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Uh, and thou hast sinned. Uh, just jump to verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Now, some of the brethren, you know, I don't know what it is about Baptists. I mean, I'm a Baptist. I love being a Baptist. But Baptists, we can, we can snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. I say a Baptist can find every cloud in the silver lining. We can always, you know, you tell a Baptist, uh, I had a guy one time, he said, pray for me. One of my students, you know, years ago, said, pray for me. And I thought, man, I said, what's the matter? He goes, 
Nothing. I said, well, see? I said, I said, what do you mean nothing's wrong? He said, well, everything's gone good. And you know when things are gone good, something bad's going to happen. So I slapped him. Okay, me and John Calvin took care of that for him. But, um, but here's the thing, guys. Don't get that. But we get that. We think, well, if things are going good, something bad's going to happen. No, no, only if you let it go to your heart. I find that statement, heart was lifted up three places. Lucifer's heart was lifted up because of his beauty. And it, and it went bad for him. Did God not do something for Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, that he did for no one else on the planet? Yes. There's not a person walking on the planet, person that ever breathed air, that can say, God, God let the sun go backwards 10 degrees just for me. That is a, mag- a magnificent thing that God did for that man. But you know what it said? It says, his heart was lifted up. God did that for me. Um, king Uzziah was a great king. He was an absolute great king. And he had all the engines of war. He had all his inventions. Uh, he had a special forces uh, troop. And, and uh, yet he was, uh, he was into husbandry. I mean, the guy was a fantastic king. But you know what it said? It said his heart was lifted up. And when his heart was lifted up, he thought, he, he thought well, I'll just go into the temple and make an offer. That was, that was not part of his job description. So I'm going to tell you something, guys. When something good is going on, don't worry about it. Don't say, oh, something good happened. No, something bad's going to happen. No, just don't get heady about it. Just don't go, well, I wonder how many people God does that for, like he did it for me. That's when your heart is lifted up. But now go back to 16 and remember the five I wills of the devil. And the devil's last I will was, I will be like the most high. Look at verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore, I will. Now, let me give you something, guys. Uh, our God, and I know I've said this here before, but, but defeating the devil is not a big deal for our God. Amen. You know, I, I get so sick and tired of people comparing this, this conflict between God and the devil uh, like it's a great big arm wrestling contest. And if something good happens today, he go, oh, look. God's, God's winning today, and something bad happens tomorrow. And it goes, oh, look, the devil's winning. Are you kidding me? I said this before. Our God could take one hair out of his head and beat the devil to death with it. You know how great our God is? He's going to face him in, in, in Matthew chapter 4, and he says to give the devil a chance. I just won't eat anything for 40 days and 40 nights. That way I'll be good and weak. And I know what you think. You think, oh, you'd really be spiritual. You'd really be hungry. I got several preacher friends of mine, and they fast 40 days at a time. And I told him, I said, Jesus only did it once, just for thought, okay? And you know what he told me? One guy said, he said, after 30 days, you lay in bed, and your body feeds off itself. Now, how would you like to be at the end of that 10 days, and somebody stands you up looking about like this mic stem here? Now you have to go face the greatest evil power in the universe. And he stepped into the ring in that condition and he knocked the devil out through the ropes with three punches. It is written, it is written, it is written. So don't get this thing about, you know, I, I, I got to tell you this, I had a pastor friend of mine, he saved me such grief. I love him to this day. He called me up and he's really down. He goes, oh, pray for me, brother. And he was going through some things. And I said, yeah, he goes, I said, what happened? He goes, he said, I, just, I just came off fasting for three weeks trying to find the will of God, and God never said anything. I said, oh, man, thanks for calling me. He said, why? Because now, if I never don't know the will of God, the foolish thought passes my head that I might fast for three weeks. I know it won't work. I can eat. I love it. But, um, but here's the thing. So, so whipping the devil is nothing. Remember uh, First Deacon's meeting, Matthew, uh, Numbers, Numbers chapter 16? Cord, Nathan, Byron, they show up to Moses and said, and, and uh, Moses said, Moses, you take too much upon you. Now, have you ever heard anybody say this? I'll make you eat your words. If you t- just keep reading in, in, in uh, Numbers chapter 16, do you know what Moses said? Ye sons of Levi, ye take too much upon you. Yes. He took their exact words. And so the devil back in Isaiah 14 was foolish enough to say, I will five times. God says, he says to heaven, watch this guy. And he said, I will cast his profane out of the mountain of God. 
Verse 16, and I will destroy the old covering chair from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings uh, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. We call that heartburn. It shall devour thee and... I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Do you know what the devil's last I will was? I will be like the most God. I will be God. I will be like the most high. Do you know what God's last I will was? You'll be ashes on the earth. God whipped the devil in Isaiah 14. He whipped him again in Matthew chapter 4. And there's a rematch coming, is there not? Now think about this, guys. You know what your salvation is? We're betting our soul on whose I will stands. We are betting our soul on which I will. When when all is said and done, the devil said, I will be like God. And God said, you'll be, I will make you like ashes on the ground. And you're betting your soul that our God is going to win that battle. Isn't that true? So there was rebellion in heaven. Now here's the problem. In fact, in fact, well, okay. Now God says, you can't have your job anymore. Where do you put him? It's kind of like going, I'm going to take you to, oh, there's no jail. (laughs) Well, what do you do? Look at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25 says this, verse 41. Then shall... Then shall he say, um, uh, also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, and everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, we do know this, guys. Do we not know that if you want to get rid of, uh, of an infection or of an infestation, doesn't fire clean it up better than anything else? Yes. You put something in fire to sterilize it, you put, put it in fire to make it clean. And so the devil... There was, hell was, did not exist. God made hell, so he had some place to put the devil and his angels. That, the first thing that means is that every person that goes to hell is going someplace they don't belong. Right. Literally, they don't belong. They may belong there because they've rejected Christ. They, they, they have merited that destiny. But the place itself, God didn't say, I will make a hell to put lost people in. He said, I will make a hell for the devil and his angels. And then when people rejected the gift of, G- of Jesus Christ and eternal life, he said, okay. I got a place. We, I got a place I can put you. But it was made for the devil and his angels. Notice that it is everlasting fire. You know what that means? That means everlasting fire. That's what it means. Uh, look at uh, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, look at verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought with his, uh, and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found uh, anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, <clears throat> that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world uh, and was cast out into the earth. Uh, and, his, and his angels were cast out with him. So the devil, uh, as near as we can tell, here's what I figure. We've got three, there are three entities not deities, entities, personalities uh, in heaven that we have names for beside, beside God. You have Michael, you have Gabriel, you have Lucifer. Lucifer gets a third of the angels. Okay, this is my, this is my math. If he's got a third of the angels, there's two other guys left, there's two thirds left, guess what? I, get, I guess Gabe gets a third, and, and uh, Michael gets a third. Now, if you study your Bible... Michael, look, Luce, or, 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 Lucifer was the anointed chair of the covered. Gabriel was the talker. When God had a message to, to deliver, you know who he sends? Gabriel. But you knew that. You knew that. Because when somebody talks a lot, you go and say, oh, they're, boy, they're Gabby. Uh, <laughs> where, do you ever wonder where that came? Why do you say, why do you say we're just Gabin? What is that? That is, we're abbreviating Gabriel. And so... <clears throat> when, when Gabriel, when, when God wants a message delivered, 
he sends Gabriel. Think about this. I believe it was Gabriel and one third of heaven talking to those shepherds that night in Luke chapter 2. Boy, that would get your attention. And it doesn't say they say. But could you imagine them saying that? Glory to God in the highest. All of the one third of heaven announcing that. Now, Michael is the George S. Patton of heaven. He's God's hit man. If God wants you dead, Michael's going to knock on your door. Um, you know, all these guys, they always say, an angel was glowing in my bedroom last night. Well, if an angel ever glows your bedroom, before you say anything, say, what's your name? If he says, Michael, cancel tomorrow's plans. <laughs> but that's why Michael is the one that goes to war. Okay? So you have these three. And so Michael has a third of the angels. Woo, could you imagine what they can do when one angel can kill 186,000 or 80, 185,000 people? One angel can do that? I would imagine there's enough just in the one-third of heaven to wipe out all life as we know it, including the germs. So Michael has one-third, Gabriel has one-third, and Lucifer has one-third, and hell was made for the devil and his angels because they, they disqualified themselves from staying in heaven. And, and I, in fact, I'll give you a little sidebar on why the devil hates you. <clears throat> First off, let me ask you a question. Don't raise your hand on this. Don't say amen. You ever get fired? I got fired. I got fired. Why do we say that? Why do we say, I got fired? If you got fired, did, did your boss, the day fired you, came and poured like three gallons of gas on you and lit you up? No. Why do we say, when we lose our job, I got fired? If you've ever dealt with clays and ceramics, you take them and you put them in a kiln, and you know what you do? You fire them. That's exactly it. But when the devil lost his job, he went to fire, he got... So from that day to this, when you lose your job, we say you got fired. Did, it, did you ever go home and say, honey, I got disemployed today? <laughs> you say, I got fired. Now, you want to know why the devil hates you? Well, first off, it's not because you love Jesus, because half of you don't. And it's, it's not because of all the stuff you're doing for him, because most of you aren't. I'm going to tell you why. And, and again, I probably use this illustration here, but here's what I want you to think. Tomorrow, tomorrow you go to work, and you walk in, and your good buddy at work says, oh man, listen, I hate to tell you this, but over the weekend, they've uh, they, uh, fired you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and, and I, I just kind of hear, you know, I got the cardboard box, we'll put your stuff in, and, and that'd be kind of a shock. And so you're walking out to your car, and your friend is trying to console you, and on the way out, in comes this guy, I mean suit, little gray around the temples, really, uh, you know, kind of a aristocratic, looks, just looks intelligent. No, no, I won't be there. But anyway, um, and you've never seen him around before, uh, and as, as you walk past him, <clears throat> the guy with you says, uh, uh, hello, Mr. Baker, and he goes, hello, Bob. And you go, uh, who, who's that? Well, well that's, that's the guy they replaced you with. Creep. Do you know him? No. Do you hate him? Yes. Well, I don't hate him. Yes, you do. <laughs> you're not going to admit it, but you're not wishing anything good on him. Hey, well, where did they find him? Well, you know, he just got done working on the, the, the batteries for the space station. And he also, he, he found what was wrong with the Three Mile Island nuclear plant. Uh, he invented, and, and if, I mean, wouldn't it be, even though you got fired and lost your job, wouldn't it be nice to know what they had to replace you with? He was teaching, you know, he did a little stint at MIT teaching. Okay, but you still don't wish him well. But wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not what happened at all. No, 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 tomorrow you go to work. The, the guy says, hey, look, I'm sorry, uh, they fired you, and, and I just want to con con console you. So now you're walking out to the car, your buddy's beside you. No, no, Mr. Businessman doesn't come walking in. Here comes Doofus. You know, he's just back from the woman's march. <laughs> he doesn't even know he doesn't qualify. And uh, he's got his little baseball hat on sideways. He's showing you this much of his underwear around the belt. He's got those baggy pants where he takes two steps before they take one. Do, 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 do. Uh, and, uh, and as you see him, he goes, uh, uh, and he goes up, hey, Bobby! And you go, uh, hi, Billy. And you look and go, stupid pizza delivery boy forgot his pizza. Oh, that's, that's, <clears throat> that's, that's not the pizza delivery boy. Well, who's that? Uh, that's your replacement. 
I mean, does that not add insult to injury? I cannot prove what I'm about to tell you happened. I don't, I'm not saying that it happened. I just like to think this. Here, the devil was running the earth. He had, he had uh, sovereignty over it. And God says, you're out of the job, pal. You're fired. Now, don't you think it would be in him to say, where are you going to find a replacement for me? You haven't got an angel out there compares to me. That's true, isn't it? Where are you going to, where are you going to find a replacement for me? Wouldn't it be something if the Lord said, uh, step over there for a second. Okay. And then he stoops down right where the devil had been standing and scoops up the dirt and goes, <clears throat> hello, Adam. Meet your replacement. You know what he got replaced by? A dirt ball. So how do you get replaced? Doesn't it say in Matthew chapter 5, we are the what of the world? We are the light of the world. We have the devil's old job. Our job is now to manifest the glory of God to this lost world. Is it not? Yes. Okay, don't, I'm gonna, don't say amen to this. But if you ever got fired, didn't you have to go get another job? And sometimes change career. I mean, you know, I was, uh, I was working as a mechanic and then I went and got a job as a house painter or whatever. The devil lost the job of manifesting the glory of God. Had to get another job, didn't he? Oh, I got the job description. It's in Revelation. You know what he's known as today? The accuser of the brethren. You know what you need to be careful? You need to be careful that you're fulfilling his first job and not helping him with the second. Yeah. I have found so many brethren who are accusers of the brethren. And I know who they work for. When somebody says, well, let me just tell you about that. Whoa, whoa, who are you working for? Well, I just do so you can better pray about it. Your work, I look, guys, guys, don't do the devil's work for him. Amen. Why don't you do, and, and think about it, <clears throat> if we end up being accused of the brethren like he is, who is going to manifest the glory of God? Who is going to be that light? If we look just like the darkness, if we dress like them, if we dance to their music, if we don't have any kind of separation whatsoever, if we're exactly like them, how are they going to see anything? So, why does hell exist? It exists because there was rebellion in heaven. And God had to have a place for the devil to go. Um, you saw in, in Matthew chapter 25, it says everlasting fire. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. In verse 22. <clears throat> but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, uh, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Hey guys, if that's in force now, we're in trouble. Because you have called a brother a fool, have you not? In fact, later the Lord calls somebody a fool. So apparently that's not our time, but it says there is hell fire. Look at chapter 18. Chapter 18 and verse 9. If this is exact, there's no dispensations. How come nobody's practicing this one? And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. Uh, it is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Guys, if, if this is for our dispensation in the age of the internet, nobody would have eyes. But it says there's hell fire. Uh, look at Mark chapter 9. And this, <clears throat> this passage is so riveting that it has to be changed in every modern translation. Two-thirds of the, of the verses I'm going to give you uh, are taken out. Verse 43, And if thine hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire <clears throat> that never shall be quenched. Everybody says, well, you know, that's really talking about Gehenna. It's talking about the city dump. Hey, I was over in Israel. You know what? Gehenna is not burning. And it said everlasting. It said never quenched. The fire of hell is never quenched. It can't be talking about some landfill in Israel. Because the landfill that was burning at that time is not burning today. And it says the fire will never be quenched. 
that, that hell fire is still burning. Verse 44, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. Uh, it is better for thee to enter, enter halt into life. Hey, Chris, did you get that? Thy foot offend thee? Just check it, brother. Then having two feet to be cast into hell, in the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Uh, it is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Guys, it is not separation from God. It is not, uh, I, I don't know, it's not soul sleep. It is fire where you burn. So, why does it exist? It exists for a place for the devil and his angels. Uh, it is fire. Where is it? Uh, I am not going to go to every one of these verses, but I'm going to give you every one of these verses. Eh, maybe I will. Um, go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. I bet all kinds of people have theories on where hell is. And um, look, if you want to have a theory on something, pick something where you might be right. Because <clears throat> you don't need to theorize where hell is. Chapter 32 and verse 22, it says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. Uh, it shall consume the earth with her, with her increase and is set on fire, uh, and said, set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So the Bible tells us that hell is low. Uh, it also says lowest hell in, uh, you might write down Psalm 86, verse 13. Look at Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11. Verse 8. It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? So we know that hell is low. To go to hell, you have to go low. To go to hell, you have to go deep. Uh, Psalm 55, verse 15 says they will go down to hell. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 18 talks about the depths of hell. Look at, look at Proverbs chapter 15. <clears throat> and since we're close, let's just go, let's scan 1918 quick. But he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. So hell is deep. It is low. Uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 24. The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from, the, from hell beneath. Guys, hell's not a hard place to find. It is a hell Michigan, isn't it? I want you to know that as a Buckeye, I believe that. But anyway, um, but it is beneath us. So hell is beneath us. Uh, hell is low, hell is down, hell is depths. Uh, in Isaiah, uh, where we just looked at it, chapter 14, he said you put him down into hell. Uh, the Bible says you could dig into hell. So hell is in the heart of the earth. It is physically located in the heart of the earth. And you know what's so funny? You know what's funny. All those scientists who tell us the Bible's not accurate, and then just say, what's in the heart of the earth? Ice cube? Man, they know it. They say, well, it's molten nickel. They don't like the idea that it is fire. It is hot. Hell is hot. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a physics reason why people, lost people go to hell. Don't let me, don't let me forget. Uh, what is it like? Look at uh, Psalm 18. <clears throat> Psalm 18. And verse 5, it says, The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Then there is sorrow. Oh, man. You know, that is the thing about hell. Do you imagine how much sorrow there must be? You know, I, I, I probably said it here at an invitation. <clears throat> I say this. Uh, you know, you got somebody, you give an invitation, come forward and trust Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. And I say, church is a terrible place to go to hell from. I mean, going to hell is horrible, is it not? But I said, if you're going to go to hell, go to hell from some college dorm party. Go to hell because you're on drugs or you're living. Can you imagine, and you know this has had to happen. 
you know it has had to be where somebody stood in a service at an invitation. The Holy Spirit tapped them on the shoulder, said, get up there and trust Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. And they said, what? Not right now, next week, when I get home. And never made it home. They were, they were killed in some way before they, right the, from church, they went to hell. Do you realize how many people are in hell right now? And they think, I really didn't have to be here. You understand how many how many Christian parents, kids that were raised by Christian parents who are in hell right now, and they rebelled against, against being in church and rebelled against the gospel and got out of church as fast as they could, and I don't believe any of that junk anymore, and now they're in hell. I mean, look, I was brought up in a... In a it was it was not a it was a heathen home. It was a Roman Catholic home. There was no gospel there. There was no light of the Bible there. You understand? And if I'd have died and gone to hell, it's because I didn't even know. But you think about some guy that or some some girl that is brought up and rebels and refuses to trust Jesus Christ, her personal savior. I know guys, preachers' sons who have gone years and years. Uh, and lived in a rebellious life and would not trust Christ their personal Savior till they were in their 30s or 40s, had destroyed their lives, but at least they got saved. But what happens if they don't get saved? Can you imagine the sorrow in hell? Hey, can you imagine the sorrow of a father whose little girl said, Daddy, Mommy saved, I got saved, I want you in heaven too. How many have heard that? How many people in hell right now have heard, Grandpa, I want you to be saved too. Grandma, I love you, I want you to get saved. Mommy, Mommy, please, get saved like Daddy did. Man, I knew a guy got saved. <clears throat> he was Roman Catholic. His wife was Roman Catholic. This guy got saved. And his wife said, if you're not a Catholic anymore, I'm going to divorce you. And she left. And what do the kids say to that? And what do you do when you're in hell? You know, what did, the, what did the, the rich man that went to hell? He thought about his brothers. Did he not? There is sorrow. You know, I got saved uh, in 1970. And my brother and I were not close at all. We were, we were enemies all of my life. Uh, he did not love me. I did not love him. We hated each other. We absolutely hated each other. It took, it took three years after I got saved for me to love him. Now, I witnessed to him because it was my duty. Because I, as a soul, I didn't want him to go to hell. And after three years, God broke my heart. I began to love my brother. And I witnessed to him for two more years. <clears throat> so from, from 1970 to 75, I witnessed to my brother try to get him to trust Jesus Christ as personal Savior. And I got a phone call from my dad one day. And he said... Uh, your brother just killed in a motorcycle accident. That was October 23rd, 1975. My brother has been in hell since then. Not because he disagreed with me, but because he did not trust Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And you know what it must be like? Because I'm not sure, you know, that when you get to hell, I, I don't know that there's a phone book. I don't know that there's a census. I don't know that you can say, uh, who else is in here with me? I mean, you, what would you do if you were in hell? You know, what I think I, I've always thought this like that. What do you think that that uh, that rich man that had four brothers? Don't you think he was saying, I hope somebody goes to him. Somebody, please go to him, go to him, please. And, you know, I've often thought I thought ever since October 20, 23rd, 1975, you know, what my brother's been saying so my brother said, you got your religion. I got mine and, and some various other things. <clears throat> and starting that day, you know what he said, Sam, don't quit. Sam, tell, tell dad and mom. I didn't believe you. I don't know if dad believes you, but, but, but keep telling him. And here's the problem. He'll never know if that prayer gets answered or not. But could you imagine if one day he stumbled into my dad in hell and said, he didn't tell you? It was 12 years before my dad got saved, my mom got saved. I have one remaining relative, my sister, six years older, has not trusted Christ as a personal savior. But the fact is, guys, that, you know, we talk about, about the fire, but we do miss the sorrow. There is going to be sorrow. And so the Bible says there is sorrow in hell. Uh, the Bible says, look at Psalm 116. Psalm 116, when people ask me to sign my, their Bibles, I write Romans chapter 10, verse 13, in case they're not saved, and 14. Uh, and I, I, I make 14 bold for the boys in case they get called to preach. But my favorite passage is the entire... 116th Psalm. This is my Psalm. And it says this in Psalm 116. It says, The sorrows of death can pass me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Guys, and there is pain involved. There is pain involved. But there's pain involved in burning, is there not? So guys, hell is, it is sorrow, it is pain, it is fire, 
And it is eternal. And, and I got news for you. There's one more thing that I'll tell you later that is almost unbearable to think about. You say, well, what could be worse than burning forever? You wait. There's, there's one more thing uh, that is almost devastating. Uh, so, so what is hell? It's sorrow. It's pain. It's fire. It has gates. Bible says it has gates. Uh, look at Revelation. Uh, I'm sorry. Get Matthew chapter 16, Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 16, Revelation chapter 1. Now look at this exchange between the Lord and the uh, apostles. Uh, Verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Oh, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art, Peter, uh, thou art Christ, the Son of of the living God. Now, I, he fired that thing out. I, one thing about Peter, you know, I've always said he had very small ram. You know, ram is the active stuff on the... Uh, he had, if, if he had, he could, I think he only have one thought in his head at one time, and before he could get another one in, the first one had to leave, and it always came out of his mouth. Because if he thought it, he said it. I'm, in the same chapter, we looked at it the other day, oh, that's never going to happen to you. We said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me. No, it's not, I'll die for you. I mean, if Peter had a thought, it came out of his mouth. Sometimes it was good, sometimes it was bad, but you always knew what he was thinking. But look at 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, uh, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, that is the great uh, verse that the Roman Catholic Church tries to convince people that uh, it is the church that was founded on Peter the Rock. But Peter's not the Rock. There's a bunch of Baptists claiming the same thing. Um, not saying that it's Peter. But here's the thing. Did you ever hear anybody say this? Um, well, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Right? The church, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Okay, can I ask anybody here? Anybody trying to get into hell? Is there anybody here trying to get into hell? Because if there's a gate and it's locked and it doesn't prevail against you, then aren't you getting to the other side of the gate? Is there anybody trying to get into hell? I'm not, and I don't think you are. But it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Not against the church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the rock. Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ was without sin, correct? But you know what he had? You see that that, that famous uh, 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 sermon that Dr. Ruckman had, sin sin on him and in him, that somebody goes to hell, that you and me. You know what we are? We got sin in us, but when we trusted Christ, we don't have our sin on us. He had no sin in him, but he had our sins on him. And here's what I want you to think about sins. I want you to think about sins as dry leaves. You know, fall, little maple leaves all curled up and brown. <clears throat> That's a sin. And every time you sin, you get this great big garbage bag. And every time you sin, uh, you, throw, uh, you throw a leaf in there. Now you say, well, that's not much. Well, I imagine if you got a truckload, it'd have some weight to it, wouldn't it? And think about this. You've had a whole lifetime to acquire a whole bunch of those. So now you show up to the gate of heaven with this big bag of sin. And you say, can I get in? And, and the angel says, uh, well, I'm sorry, but uh, no, all is sin. Well, will you forgive me? Okay, you're forgiven. Not going to get in? No, because you still have the physical commodity on you. You have been forgiven your sin, but they're still here. Okay? We can't let that in. If we let that in, it'll be like a Baptist church. <laughs> and so, um, you know what the Lord did? He took our sins on him. The Bible says that he went to the heart of the earth. Now, he, now, you know, there's a teaching that he went down there for three days and three nights. This bozo out in Phoenix says, in fact, he says that is part of the gospel. That is not part of the gospel. Amen. And I know, you know, Jesus wasn't in hell for three days and three nights because he said to the thief beside him, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Amen. 
But now I'm going to ask you to think. And guys, look, here's what we say. Where the Bible does not explain something, we use logic. It's okay to use logic as long as you don't, as long as you don't sanctify it. Don't make your logic. I'm going to tell you what, what, is, what I am seeing. You don't have to agree with me. But also, if you don't agree with me, that doesn't make you a heretic to me. And I'm sorry, but I'm not a heretic with you disagree with me. Because that is the great unpardonable sin, to disagree with you. And so, <clears throat> what, what do you do with leaves? You burn them. So, he went down to the heart of the earth. He went into hell to get rid of those leaves. Now, if you were the devil, now you should have a lot a lot easier to think about than trying to be God. Your great enemy has just come through the gates of hell to get rid of those sins. Take a look. Keep, keep this here, but look at Revelation chapter 1. Now, I'm going to ask you this. You know, God, you know what, I, what I've always noticed? God isn't into symbolism. Liberals are into symbolism. God doesn't do things symbolically. If God, if God makes something, there's a purpose for it. Look at verse 18. Jesus is talking. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Uh, amen. And have the keys to, of what? Hell and death. All right. You think that was, that's just like two neat keys to carry around on a chain? Or is there some day when he's going to use the key to hell and the key to death? Well... He steps into hell to unload our sins, and the devil says, lock that gate. I got him. He is here. And he turns around, and the Lord goes, that wasn't locked when I came in. Well, I'm in trouble, I guess. Now, let me tell you, something happened, oh, many, many years ago. I preached for this guy. It is the only preacher I've ever preached for in 46 years that I contemplated what would happen if I, if I decked him. And I didn't. To this day, I'm not sure I made the right decision. Um, he had a wonderful wife. He used to send her in a church van in a horrible neighborhood every Sunday morning. Uh, he did not take care of his family. He was uh, a very obnoxious man, uh, was not an honest man. And we had to stay in their, their, they had an apartment. We had to stay in their apartment. And at that time, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it was. Uh, John is 40, 40, babe? This is 39 years ago. Somewhere right around there. Because John's a baby. And Kathy takes our baby into this bedroom. He's just and lays him on a bed and closes the door. Well, in a few minutes, she wants to go check. And she goes to the door. And the doorknob just turns. It doesn't open. Either way, it doesn't open the door. Well, now, you know how fast panic hits you? I mean, it's not like the kid's going to die in the next second, but I still need to be in there in the next second. And so I go to this guy and I said, um, how do you get this door open? We put our baby on the, uh, sleeping on the bed and, and, we, and my wife closed the door. And we, he goes, oh, yeah, that door doesn't handle it. We don't close that door. I said, yeah, but we closed it and our baby's on the other side. Oh, yeah, but that door doesn't, we don't, you don't close that door because that, that door handle doesn't work. Well, what am I supposed to do? Slide pizza under the door for the next 18 years so you know it from the inside? Now, fortunately, I had a key to that door. In my shoe. Yes, sir. And I'm telling you, split the door frame. I mean, I just kicked right at that hand, split the door frame, and I looked at him like, you say something, you get kicked next. And I put it all back together. And, uh, you know, I brought the baby out. My wife was crying. They're going to make a movie about it. <laughs> if Stallone will take my part. But, um, and, and I know, you know, I'm, I'm probably over, over dramatic. But here's the thing the Lord dumps off our sin, and He comes up and goes, Look at that. And probably what He did, He's got the, door, the key to hell. Well, when did He use it? He's certainly not going to go down to hell and let people escape. And He probably just went, No problem, I got the key. But you know what I like to think? I like to think he went, I got the key. Boom! <laughs> and the gates of hell shall not prevail against Jesus, the rock. 
So in hell there are sorrows and pain and fire and gates. And I am not looking. You know, I'm not talking about the, the church. Oh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. I've never found a church yet trying to get into hell. Um, who or what goes to hell? The devil goes to hell. Uh, his angels go to hell. The lost go to hell. Take a look at Proverbs chapter 23 and Matthew chapter 5. In Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 14, it says, uh, by the way, I haven't got it. Young parents, you want to guarantee your kid's salvation? Beat them. Spank them. Look what it says. Uh, Withhold not correction from, verse 13, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with a rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. Man, every time I turned my boys over the knee, over my knee, I was dealing with their heart. And they got saved. But it says his soul. So a soul goes to hell. But look at uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 30. And it says, and if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable uh, for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. <clears throat> so in hell are going to be the souls and the bodies of the damned. Ultimately, the body and the soul of the damned will be there. Um, and in the Lord went there. Uh, look at uh, Ephesians chapter 8. No, oh, chapter if you can find Ephesians chapter 8, you've got a hole. Get your Bible and leave. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. And it says, um, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive uh, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So the Lord went there, but he did not stay. did not stay there for three days and three nights. Uh, He stayed there probably very briefly. I know this. He he went and preached to the spirits in prison and then left. Um, Now, let me give you a, a, a physics reason why lost people go to hell. I mean, why going to hell is inevitable. You know, we think of air uh, as having no weight, but it does have weight, correct? I mean, if you fill a balloon with air, not gas, but air, and let go of it, it will not float in the air. It will go down, correct? I I don't know when they did this long time ago for some particular study. They were studying what happens to a body when they die. Now, these people on these very intricate scales, and they said that, that what they found was that when, when a person died, not talking about first breath in, last out, and the weight of that breath, they knew what they weighed without breath, but when they died, they lost 21 grams of weight. Okay? So that would, let's just say the soul weighs 21 grams. Now, that is not heavy. All right, that's not heavy at all. But if I had a balloon that weighed 21 grams and I let go of it, which way would it go? It's got three choices. Up, stay, or down. Which would it do? Okay, think about this, guys. You know this. We are not our bodies. We are in our bodies. We are the soul that is in the body. So, oh, ladies, aren't you glad to know you only weigh 21 grams? That's one of the best news some you got in years. I expect something in the offering for this. But um, now, do you know what keeps... Now, all right, what if I had something here... That nothing, it went through the floor. There's nothing, it weighed 21 grams, but it went through the floor. Nothing could stop it. Where would it end up? It'd end up in the center of the earth. It'd end up in hell. The only thing that keeps us from going to hell, the soul, for a lost man, is he's in this. He's in this package. So when a lost man dies, that, that soul comes out of the body, and there's nothing to prevent it from just naturally. Law of nature, law of gravity. There's nothing to keep him from going to hell. So 
people go to hell because it is natural, because they have a weight, the, the body, they're, they're in this body, which stands on the earth, but once it steps, once that soul comes out of the body, nothing stops it, so it naturally, 21 grams of weight, naturally ends up in hell. That's natural, correct? Okay, what if I blow up a balloon? Uh, no, I'm a preacher. If I say it floats, you'll say hot air. What if, we, if somebody blows up a balloon, not with gas, and I let go of it, and it goes down? That is natural, right? What if I let go of it, and it goes up? That's unnatural, or supernatural. You know what's going to happen to you when your soul steps out of your body? It would naturally go to hell, but we have a supernatural power that, that overpowers nature, and up we go. So the lost go to hell because it is natural to go to hell. Um, why do people go there? Look at Matthew chapter 23. And get John chapter 3. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 verse 33. Wherefore behold, uh, I send unto you the prophets uh, and wise men and scribes. And some of them ye shall kill and crucify. And some of them uh, shall ye scourge in your synagogues. Oh, I'm sorry. That's verse verse. 34, verse 33. Uh, you serpent, your generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? So people that go to hell are there because they are damned. They are condemned. They are damned. Uh, that is the word, guys. Now look at uh, John chapter 3. Look at verse 15. For whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world... That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Verse 36, he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You go to hell because you haven't taken the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the sole and complete payment for your sins. Now, here is something to note, and I'm not going to tell you how to, I'm not going to tell you change how you win souls. But the fact is, the fact is that when we tell people, if you don't trust Christ, you're going to die and you're going to go to hell. First off, never say this. I've heard people say, you're going to go to hell and pay for your sins. No, because then it'd be purgatory. If you pay for your sins, wouldn't you get out? Right? Nobody's paying. Nobody's getting out. But have you ever said to somebody, if you don't trust Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell and burn forever? Or you're going to burn forever in hell? That's not true. That is not. That is, they're going to burn forever. But that is not absolutely doctrinally accurate. Look at Revelation chapter 20. And get to Isaiah chapter 34. Revelation 20 and Isaiah 34. Verse 12, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small, and great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Uh, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Guys, here's what it is. Ultimately, when you, here's, here's, here's what you would really be telling people. Now, I'm not telling you to be this detailed. But you don't say, if you don't trust Christ, you're going to die and go to hell and burn forever. You go, you're going to die and go to hell uh, until the end of time. Uh, and then you're going to be judged and, uh, and then you're going to go to the lake of fire. And there you're going to burn forever. <laughs> but if you want to tell them that, that's more accurate. 
I have been mocked for what I'm about to tell you, but I, I can give no better description for hell than this. Hell, all right, if a guy robs a, a, a gas station tonight, shoots the attendant, and the police catch him, they're going to take him to jail. Is that his punishment for the crime? No, he hasn't even been judged for the crime. They are keeping him, keep him, keeping him in jail until he has been tried and judged. And once, do you understand that they take a guy from jail to his court appearance, and if the jury comes in and says, we find the defendant guilty 20 years to life in wherever, he doesn't even go back to jail. I mean, he comes out of jail that morning, and he sits there at his trial, and they go, oh, well, we haven't made a decision, and he goes back to jail. It's a holding tank. And he, maybe he comes in there four or five days in a row, and everything, well, they haven't made a decision yet, back to jail he goes. He comes up and he's sitting there, in the, or he comes back and he's sitting in the court and they go, okay, we've made a decision. He's getting one to 20, 20 years to life in prison. He does go to jail. He goes to prison. The people that are in hell right now aren't going to be in hell forever in hell because the Bible says, look, have they been judged? No, they have not been judged. Just like the guy in jail hasn't been judged. Isn't it awful to think that that rich man has been in hell all that time and he hadn't even been judged yet? But then death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, where is the lake of fire? That is not in the center of the earth. Um, that, is, uh, that is down south. Go look at uh, Isaiah 34. And that is an area in Israel that is known as Idumea, down south of the Dead Sea. And... Um, Bozra, look what it says in verse 5. For my, now watch the prophecy here. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Um, behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood, is made fat with fatness and the blood of lambs and goats, uh, with the fat of kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozra and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, uh, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust shall be fat with fatness. Uh, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, and the year of recompense uh, for the controversy of Zion. Now watch this. This is the area. This is the physical area called the Negev uh, in Israel. It's south of the Dead Sea. It's known as, if you look on your map, you'll see Idumea and Bozrah are in that area. It says, and the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. Remember, everlasting fire. Uh, the smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, the owl also, and the raven... Now, I have a theory about demons. Um, you know, when you look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 23 through 26, and it parallels Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2, the earth was not form and void. And it goes down through there about what ha happened when God overthrew uh, Lucifer. And there's only two living entities that are mentioned, man and birds. And so uh, we know angels are men, and I think the birds are the demons. I think that's what they ended up. Because look what is going to inhabit that lake of fire. All birds. Uh, the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. So there is going to be a lake of fire on this earth, and everybody that's in hell right now will someday be on the lake, in that lake of fire on this earth. Now, question, because there's got to be a little bad thought about it. You say, well, what if, what if I'm on this earth, and I look in there, and I see somebody that I love? Um, I got news for you. You're going to go buy it every month. And you probably will see people that you love. But it won't mean a thing. <clears throat> Look at Isaiah chapter 35, uh, uh, no, 65. Get 65 and 66. And when I think of somebody where they're going to a place where there is sorrow and pain, as I've described to you, where there's going to be nothing but burning and torment, and all of that horror, 
What could be worse? Let me show you what could be worse. What could add to it? Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. And behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. You believe that, don't you? Look what's going to happen when the new heaven and earth are made. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Now look what the prophecy says is going to happen in that new heaven and new earth. Look at chapter 66 and look at verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, so it hadn't happened yet, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Now watch. And it shall come to pass, this is prophecy, that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me saith the Lord. Now, here's what I want you to see. We're talking about the new heaven and new earth. The Lord is now reigning the universe from a throne in Jerusalem, correct? And it says, every new moon, every month, all flesh is going to come to Jerusalem and worship Him, right? Okay, is that going to include you? Aren't you flesh? Look what happens after the worship service. 24, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. We will go by that lake of fire every month, maybe, to, hey, I'll bet you'll thank God you're saved. You'll be thanking God you're saved all, for all eternity. You say, well, what happens if I see my dad, my mom, my brother, my sister that didn't get saved? It says in, in verse 17 of the previous chapter, we won't remember. We won't even remember. You know what's got to be... Now think about going to hell and suffering, sorrow, pain, burning. And on top of that, everybody that ever knew you forgets that you ever existed. You are absolutely anonymous in hell. No one will ever... Well, you know, oh, at least they're thinking about me. No, they're not. New heaven, new earth, we will not remember this. I'm sorry, guys. You're not going to look back and go, well, I was on the earth. No. We're not going to remember any of this. And you ought to really say, praise God about that. But the fact is, guys, that we will see our damned relatives and our damned friends, are the people that did not trust Jesus Christ, we will see them. Now, I don't know about this. What if they remember? What if you were in that lake and you, what if you were on the lake and you saw on the shore your brother, your sister? And, they, and, and you're trying to yell something to them. You, you can't even communicate. Now, I don't know for sure that or not. They may not remember either. But guys, as horrible as hell is, the sorrow and the pain and the fire, that's not bad enough. They won't even be remembered. You know, when somebody doesn't remember you, it is as though you never existed. It is as though you always existed in that fire. That's horrible. Say, how horrible? It is so horrible that God would let his son go through the torture that he went through and the torment that he went through and the pain and the shame uh, and the the beatings and then be crucified so that nobody had to go there. That is how horrible it is. It is so horrible that this God said, I don't want him to go and I will make a way. And it's not a cheap way. It is the most expensive thing he could could pay. Is that not true? If If he would have paid our weight in gold, that would have been a lot of money, would it not? But no. He paid with the blood of his only begotten son. Which I say this. When somebody says, well, you know, I don't think a God of love would put anybody there. And and here's what I tell them. I got three sons. And I hate to say this, guys. You may not agree with me, but oh, well. If you were on your way to hell right now, and I'd let one of my sons die so you go to heaven, you go to hell. You say, I thought you loved us. Yeah, I do. It's not not as much my son. I would not let my son go through what what Jesus went through for you. But if I did, I'd still have two kids left over, wouldn't I? God only had one. And I told a guy one time, because he gave me that, that sorry line, you know, I don't think a God of hell would put anybody in, a God of love would put anybody in hell. And I said, look, bud, if I let my son, you think about it, parents. I said, if I let my son come down here, and they spit on him, and they whipped him, and they beat him up, and they, they uh, put a crown of thorns on his head, and they drove nails through his hands, and they mocked him, and they murdered him, I said, if if I let my son go through that for you and you rejected it, I would put you in hell myself. 
When you showed up in front of me, I would grab you by the collar and I would grab you by the belt and I would walk over, uh, over top of hell and I would rehearse every single bit of suffering. My, and it wasn't just that little bit of time after he was arrested, guys. He was God in the flesh. Do you know what it must have been like to be on this earth? I think it was, I think it was suffering from day one. And I would, I would rehearse everything my son suffered for you and then I'd put you in hell. You think about how horrible hell is and then you think, you say, well, it's not right. God says, what do you mean it's not right? I gave my son so you didn't have to go. Right. Yes, sir. I could give no more. There is nothing higher in the universe. There is no price higher. We are not worth the price. Corporate Christianity from all time is not worth what God paid for us. And so if you go to hell, you go because you chose. And you go to hell because you deserve it. Because if you reject that payment, knowing you're going to that place... Go to hell. That's where you're going. And you're going to stay there until the lake of fire. You are going to burn. And you are going to be not only suffer, but you are going to be forgotten by the very people that loved you. That granddaughter that hugged your neck said, Grandpa, get saved. She won't even know you existed. The husband, the wife, the dad, the mom, the brother, the sister, whoever it was that said, please, I love you so much, cried for your soul in front of you, and you laughed or just said, I don't need any of this. I am telling you guys, they won't even remember you. Look right at you in the lake of fire. Won't even remember you. But God paid with his son so that nobody has to go. That, that is, there's no greater evidence of his love for us. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. On the outside chance, somebody here... <clears throat> You're trusting whatever being in the church or your daddy, your mom or whatever. If you haven't trusted Christ or you're not sure, make sure tonight. If you're not saved, get saved tonight. But if you're saved, do you understand what you are saved from? You're saved from sorrow. You're saved from pain. You're saved from fire. You know what you're saved from? You're saved from being forgotten. When I think of the lost... Being in eternity, being in, being in the lake of fire for eternity, and not even being remembered mm. by the very people that cried for their souls when they were here. And you say, well, that's all horrible. It is so horrible that God said, I'd let my son die to keep you out of it. And if you're not saved, if you don't take the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the sole complete payment for your sin, you will go to hell because you deserve it. If you are saved, don't you have a lot to thank God for? Yes. Aren't you glad? Aren't you thankful? Isn't he worth living for? Mm. Father, hell's horrible, God. It is horrible. It's not just a word that we're supposed to accent a sentence with. It is not something we're supposed to threaten people and shake our fist when we get mad at them. Or to exclaim when things don't go our way. It is a literal, physical place. Beneath the feet of all of us. While we carry on our lives every day beneath us. There is anguish and pain and sorrow. And mourning. But here we still remember who is down there. But on top of all that God the day will come. And they will be pulled out of hell. Put into the lake of fire. And then in the new heaven and new earth. And the very people that we loved and prayed for and wept for. And even now grieve for. We won't even remember them. Because how could it be heaven if grief could enter? And you're going to make it so it can't enter. We won't remember it. Lord, if there's one here that by chance hasn't trusted your son as our personal savior, I hope they do it tonight. Because church is a terrible place to go to hell from. And for the saved ones, God, they got saved because they knew they deserved hell. They didn't get saved because they thought they were good. They, they got saved because they knew how bad they were. But God, let us always be thankful. Always be thankful for your mercy, your great grace. What you let your son suffer so we didn't have to, God, it is something else. I don't know how we could, I know we can't pay you back, but God, we want to, we want to give everything we can in our lives. Use some of these people, these young people. Let them use their lives in some way just to say thanks, to serve the God that saved them. That'd be such a fine thing that you would get glory from a purchased possession. In Jesus Christ's name I pray.
Amen. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, there's a piano place. Folks will come. And if you need to talk to the Lord, now's the time.